بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, I've been asked to uh, speak uh, to you today about the Islamic city and also its relationship to uh, the environmental problems that we face today or the whole philosophy of man's relation to the environment, whether it's today or yesterday, but especially today. Of course, there's a large order and I cannot uh, say too much in the half hour I'm going to speak with you. But nevertheless, it would be a pleasure for me to uh, say something about this matter. Uh, first of all, it's very important to make a point clear. Uh, Muslims should be aware that uh, Islam all that began in Mecca, which was a town, and later on the Prophet وسلم, migrated to Medina, which is, of course is also a town. The word Medina is self meaning city, city of the Prophet, Medina to Nabi in Arabic. Uh, the society in general in Arabia when Islam was revealed was primarily nomadic, primarily nomadic. And there is a nomadic spirituality which is deeply associated with the heart of Islam. For example, not over trusting the things of this world. It has even affected Islamic architecture and city planning. In the old days, each generation built for itself, not as if they were going to live forever like they do in modern times, using cement and steel. They built from simpler material, although heavy material was available like a stone, many people built from brick or uh, uh, mud or so forth and so on that we see throughout the Islamic world. It was not only economic necessity, there was a philosophy connected with it. That is to realize the passing nature, the transience of the world, and also not to over solidify, over crystallize, uh, become too heavy. These are all traits of a kind of nomadic spirituality which Islam has contained within itself. But this having been said, there's no doubt that Islamic civilization, as we know it, rose in the Islamic cities. And it's not accidental that the word uh, city and civilization have the same root in the language I'm speaking right now. And also in Islamic languages, uh, although the word Hidara is used in Arabic, which is related, in fact, to uh, settlement, to uh, uh, human settlement. In Persian and Turkish, and classical Turkish, Ottoman Turkish, and other languages, we use the word tamaddun, which is, in fact, comes from the city, like, like civilization. Uh, in, uh, the very word is re reveals how what we call civilization is related to the city. Of course, the city was also the source of decadence, of moral decadence, and also of much greater uh, violence uh, uh, than the countryside. Of course, there were wars also among the nomads, but they lived a simpler life, much closer to nature. And, and many of the strong uh, forces of the soul to uh, gain control, to gain power, to gain wealth, and so forth and so on, which uh, are the running motives for so much contention throughout history in all civilizations, uh, was stronger in the cities. Ibn Khaldun, the great Islamic historian, of course, has devoted a great deal of study to this uh, rhythmic relation between the nomad and the city, and this point of the gradual decadence that takes place in the city and then the uh, city is rejuvenated usually by nomadic attacks which revi revive it and new uh, dynasties come and so forth into which I cannot go. But we can say that uh, what we consider to be Islamic civilization is the fruit of cities. But cities not only as big cities that we have, we have today but also small towns. Let us remember that probably the first city in the world to have a million people was in the Islamic world. It was the city of Neshabur in Khorasan, in my own country, Iran, Persia. 
which was destroyed by the Mongol invasion and everyone was put to death. Even the cats and dogs, every living creature was put to death. One of the great atrocities of the Mongol invasion. And now it's a small town, of course, but before that, they say it was the first city where had a million people in it, more before Beijing or uh, Indian cities or certainly before Paris and London, which were then small towns. Uh, Anyway, uh, besides that, uh, the Islamic world had also other major cities with fairly sizable populations, as many of them have great centers of culture, such as Isfahan, Cairo, Damascus, and Baghdad, and so forth. I will not go over the list. However, it's very important to realize that the intellectual activities that we associate with cities were not confined to these big cities. Yes, there were very good madrasas, in all these cities that I mentioned. Alaska University still survives in Morocco, the Qarawiyin and Fez, some of the other schools in um, uh, Baghdad and so forth were destroyed by the Mongols. A few survived, al Sariya and so forth. Uh, but anyway, the British schools, very important schools, and many people came to them. But it's also very important to note, important point to note that uh, there were many people who studied in small towns. And some of the greatest thinkers of Islam came from small towns and only later came to big cities for, let's say, advanced studies or something like that. Let me give you an example. One of the greatest Islamic philosophers, Sohrawardi. Sohrawardi came from a little town called Sohrawardi, which even now most Persians can't locate on the map. It's too small. It's in Western Iran. Near Zanjan, the city of Zanjan, and this little town whose, ne- whose geography is forgotten so much. Look at the number of people uh, produced in Islamic history. All the Sohrawardis uh, through the Sohrawardi order in India who are so famous, and of course, the great philosopher, Shah Shahabuddin Sohrawardi, come to this little town. And then they, he started in Zanjan, of course, later on to Isfahan and here and there, but uh, he came and had the earliest. Uh, formation in small t- towns. So it's very important to remember that although the Islamic city is, of course, the center of Islamic civilization in so many ways, it's not only big cities, it was small towns and uh, going down to the level of what we call even large villages, uh, that their centers where education was carried out, where culture was preserved. As, great poetry was created, great prose was created, and so forth and so on. Of course, there's no doubt that for example, in a field like astronomy, you need to have astronomers who have uh, instruments, and later on, of course, had observatories, the first built by Maraga, by Nasir de Tusi, and the town, just of Holaku. Yes, that was a town, that was a city, the, the, the remains of the observatory are still there. I'm not denying that. Or great hospitals, of course, like the uh, hospital that, that Razi was the director of in Baghdad or other places like that. But it's also important to realize that it is not like what many Muslims think today. That all, all Islamic culture will belong to the big cities. The towns are without culture and without thought and so forth and so on. That's total nonsense. That's not at all the case. Uh, different aspects of Islamic civilization including knowledge, the sciences, learning, and so on and so on, also had representations in small towns. And this is a very important thing to realize. So we, call, we identify Tamadun with Mudun, uh, with city or civilization with Kivitas in Latin with city. We must not be in our mind that, oh, we mean cities like London and New York and Paris, the big cities and Rome and so forth. No. It goes down to very small towns, which have produced some of the greatest thinkers, writers, poets of the Islamic world. There's no doubt about that. Now, uh, having said this, uh, I want to say something about the structure of the city itself in Islamic civilization. Uh, In Islamic civilization, as in fact in most other traditional civilizations, the city was always limited by being walled, the walled city. I usually had 12 gates corresponding to 12 signs of the zodiac and 12 months of the, of the year. And I hold 
ge geographical orientation symbolizing the four seasons and so forth and so on into which I cannot go, but it was symbolic. And has some of the most beautiful gates uh, all the way from Morocco in Meknas, the famous gate in Meknas, to the Quran gate in Shiraz, some of which have survived in these cities, uh, were gates into the city. Many of them were destroyed in the 20th century, 19th century, when the Islamic cities following Western models suddenly began to splurge and break the walls around them and became really urban sprawl that we have today. The ugliness of a present day Cairo or Tehran or Lahore has nothing to do with traditional Islamic cities. Traditional Cairo meant uh, Fatimid Cairo and later on Mamluk Cairo. And it was uh, in its walled and bound and structured and was always a relationship with the outside, you know, which was a positive relationship. Now this brings me uh, down to a very crucial issue, which I really don't have time to deal too much now. But let me say that uh, the modern city, since the rise of the Industrial Revolution, and even before that, but especially since the 17th century, modern times, 17th, 18th century, is completely out of equilibrium with its natural environment. A supreme example of a city like New York. To cut off New York from its environment, and there's no food, uh, that cannot grow its own wealth, uh, he healthy food to eat, or any kind of food, people would starve to death. And its effect upon this environment is immense. From 50 miles from, uh, before you get to New York in the middle of New Jersey, you feel the industrial. Uh, blight, uh, the ugliness of the countryside, the blackness of the soil, all of these things before you reach the Holland Tunnel to get into New York. And the same is true of the big cities. I just gave New York as an example, it was a kind of a supreme example. The cities are totally out of balance with their ambience. A traditional Islamic town, I don't mean to say it is a big city, it's a town a village in Afghanistan right now, could be cut off from the rest of the world for the next 10,000 years and survive. If nothing else happens, you know, earthquakes, invasions, I'm not talking about that. And this is a very important point to consider. The Islamic city was always in equilibrium with its environment. Of course, there were fields outside that planted uh, the produce that the people in the city ate and so forth and so on. No doubt about the gardens that gave fruit. But there was ecologically and environmentally a remarkable balance. And this balance penetrated even into the Islamic city, into the individual buildings. This is really a story for another day. But it's very, very important a tradition, to realize that traditional Islamic architecture was based on balance with the natural world around it. Every traditional Islamic house and architectural form, whether it be in the Medina of Meknas and Fas, or in uh, Kashan and Yazd in my country or anywhere in between or other places, was, uh, was based on this equilibrium. For example, making maximum use of the shade during the day in places where the sun was hot, Maximum use of cool air uh, with these narrow streets, which uh, in a sense imprisoned the cool air of the night and prevented it from rising. Whereas we have a big avenue, that doesn't happen. That's why even now, if you walk in one of these traditional old medieval parts of any Islamic city, it's about 10, 15 percent uh, degrees cooler than if you come to one of the big boulevards built in the 20th century by various governments in the form of European uh, city planning that they copied from Hausmann or somebody else. So uh, it's very important to realize that the Islamic city and individual architecture tried to live in harmony with the environment. 
I always give this uh, uh, example, but it's really a stunning example. Many decades ago, I was president of Iran's leading scientific and, and uh, university. And the question of air conditioning and things that I came up and all these ugly buildings were coming up in Tehran full of glass as if they were in Sweden without considering that we're living in the Middle East, the sun is what it is and so forth and so on. It was a big battle going on. And I uh, asked some of my professors to carry out research and came up actually with these results that if, if traditional architecture, rather than the modern style of boxes, uh, glass boxes, or cement boxes that they built uh, on top of each other, were encouraged and used as much as possible. It, money of that time to keep the temperature of the summer and the winter the same as now you have through artificial air conditioning and cooling system and so forth and so on, would uh, save you. Iran, around $400 million of that day, which was billions of dollars of today, just one city, the city of Tehran. And of course, nobody paid uh, the attention, uh, question of greed, of necessity, what they thought about it was to be modern, and look what has happened uh, in the last 50 years. The Tehran used to be a big garden when I was a child. Now, it's like in a big city from Seoul to uh, got, uh, New York, the big sky, sky scrapers, sky, skyscrapers, excuse me, all over. So uh, it's very important to realize when we talk about the Islamic city, besides the social aspect, division of labor, access to sacred places, the centrality of the mosque and the madrasa, so many things into which I have not gone. Uh, it's impossible to go in a few minutes. But I want to bring out the salient feature that the Islamic city was based on a philosophy. It interiorized family life, it protected it. The Islamic homes looked inward rather than outward. What is important in modern Western city like in America where I live now is the outside of the house. What is important in Islamic house is the inside wall of the, of the wall of the garden, of the space rather than the outside. Everything is interiorized. The question of, uh, very important of the neighbor of building in such a way as not to intrude upon other spaces of others and therefore to have a kind of freedom of space vertically all the way to heaven, having to do with women being uh, free in their own house to dress as they will, rather than have somebody looking from the third floor of an apartment house next door into, into the house, which all of which are not happening in the Islamic world and the terrible cases that have occurred that will not go into now, but the traditional architecture is based on these principles. These principles were both religious and spiritual and also practical, and also practical and ecologically sane and very safe. Most of the architectural practice of the Islamic city are still very, very important models from the point of view of those who wish to create an architecture which is also environmentally sound. That's why, for example, like someone like Abdul Wahid al wakil the famous Egyptian architect, who built all the small houses and uh, mosques along the Corniche in Arabia, using traditional architecture, has been so successful, has been so successful in creating something which is completely Islamic, economically feasible, in fact, much cheaper than many of the expensive things that they built, and also ecologically and environmentally sound, using much less energy and uh, having much less negative impact upon the environment. So uh, altogether, the question of the Islamic city in its relation to the environment is, is related to the Islamic philosophy of, of the city and urban design. The two are inseparable. You cannot have in the Islamic world, a Western style philosophy of city planning and urban design. It's a completely different philosophy. I don't even want to criticize it, but it's a completely different philosophy than Islamic. And then talk about uh, Islamic uh, principle of harmony with nature or with the environment. 
the two will not go. Of course, in the West, going back to Frank Lord Wright, and many of the very, very important Western architects, including some of the people in the Bauhaus in Germany, there were people who realized that Islamic architecture had a lot to teach Western architecture. And uh, in fact, some of them thought that the geometric forms of building of these buildings was a kind of emulation of Islamic art. And I had sometimes debates with them when I was a PhD student at Harvard that that sacred geometry that you see in Islamic, not, not a quantitative geometry that you're using here, are reducing everything to uh, black uh, to uh, glass boxes. Anyway, uh, but the awareness has been there among certain uh, very, very important architects. And uh, just to conclude, uh, I'm, I want to say that I'm happy that uh, the awareness is gradually being reborn of the importance of Islamic architecture, despite the sprawl of the cities, the spread of Westernization, and all of these things that have gone on that in, during the last half century. There are today a lot more young architects, Turks, Arabs, Persians, Indians, Pakistanis, and so forth, who are after creating an Islamic, authentic Islamic form of architecture than they were 50 years ago. I've been in exile for several decades in this country. One of the most important group of people who write to me constantly are young architects. Not only Persian, but mostly Persian, but also Pakistanis, Indians, uh, uh, Egyptians, and sometimes here and there. And there's tremendous interest among the young in creating an authentic Islamic architecture in a situation in which now, fortunately, the world realizes that modern civilization cannot go on like this without destroying the environment, and that we need to do something drastic. No, it's not being done, but at least many people realize it, at least. Making money is still more important, so I'll keep procrastinating. But some people are doing something, so there's no doubt about that. And that also helps the situation of trying to revive Islamic city planning and architecture in such a way that to bring out its philosophy or harmony with the natural world, with the environment around it. If it succeeds, even on a small scale, it would spread. As one man in Egypt, Hassan Fati, one man who began to try to revive traditional architecture and was totally neglected in Egypt because it was too beautiful and too cheap. And so the ministries of construction and so we couldn't make money out of it as much as they'd wanted to. So they shut him up until situation changed and we organized in Iran a major conference, international conference of Islamic architecture, which I was in charge and I invited Hassan Fati and uh, got his book, Building for the Poor, published by the University of Chicago Press. And that put Hassan Fati on the map. And then his students, Abdul Wahid al-Wakil, Omar Farouk, other famous Egyptian architects gradually became known. His influence spread elsewhere. Uh, and he's played a very important role in giving courage also to a younger generation of Muslim architects or those who are not Muslim, but are practicing architecture, Allah, the Islamic tradition. Anyway, uh, what we need, just to conclude, is first of all, we need succinct works on the philosophy of Islamic architecture, on art, and the city, as has been done by people like Titus Burkhardt in his book, for instance, The First City of Islam, Stadt des Islam, First is Stadt des Islam in German, which has been translated into English, in which it brings out the Islamic philosophy of the city and one of the greatest traditional cities of the Islamic world and others, we need to expand that. And we also need to have the younger generation of people who are now that have their hands in building things, from bazaars to malls, to houses, to God knows what, uh, to be able to not only work, but also to write about what they're doing, what ideas are, what should be done, in a time which is really uh, very important, critical, because, what we do with architecture is not just fantasy. It will affect not only everyday life, but it will also affect the environment, the world in which we live. 
and our survival depends on living in harmony with the world around us. And that is impossible without ha having an imprint, which for man, its main imprint is architecture, city planning, streets, buildings, and so forth and on earth. To have this imprint uh, be in harmony with the natural world. I thank all the Turkish authorities who have organized this conference, who have given me this prize. I thank you very much for it. And I pray that your efforts and your goals will be realized in the best way possible. Assalamu alaikum.